All right, so in this video, I will be checking out the Intel 12600KF CPU quite briefly. So the 12600KF might be one of the most interesting CPU models in the whole Alder Lake CPU lineup, as this is uh, pretty much the cheapest. I think it's one of the cheapest uh, unlocked models in this whole uh, uh, launch. Uh, it has pretty good value for your money, but uh, it's not, of, of course, it's not the... Uh, best in terms of value at the moment because now with the non-K overclocking we can get even better like options in terms of value like uh, the 12100F uh, which is uh, a quad-core CPU and uh, with non-K overclocking you can actually overclock it and it only costs like a bit over 100 euros but the sad thing is that we don't have cheap and I do mean very cheap motherboards that do actually support non-K overclocking. Yes, we know that now we do have some individual uh, cheap motherboards that do support it, like the B660 Strix motherboard. I think that's the model De Bauer used in his latest video. But even, well, even a 200 euro motherboard is quite expensive for a 110 euro CPU. That's what I think. But of course, then there's the uh, uh, locked 6-core model as well, like the 12400. I think that's a more interesting option for many of you guys. But anyways, the 12600KF is still a very good CPU model. Now, I think you can get it for even under 300 euros. At the time of making or at the time of purchase, uh, it was around like 300 to 310 euros here in Finland for the KF model and the 12600K was 340. So at the time, the difference was between like 30 to 40 euros. And if you can get such a difference for the non-IGP version, I would obviously purchase the KF. But uh, very often, the price of the K and the KF is exactly the same. So uh, if the price is exactly the same, like even within just like one to two euro difference, I would obviously take the K model. I personally, I have never used the iGPU on pretty much any of any of the uh, like uh, generations. So I always use a discrete graphics card in my systems. But well, if you don't save any money by leaving the iGPU uh, from the product, there's no sense to save money from the. Uh, iGPU if you actually don't save anything. So that's what I think. If the price is exactly the same, I would always take the K model. That's what I wa wanted to say. But anyway, so let's enter the BIOS and I will just go straight to like OC profiles and 6933. But of course, I might try to drop these uh, settings. So uh, stress testing these older lake CPUs can actually be quite hard on some other boards. So I I was actually uh, briefly testing one of these CPUs and I had Pro95 crashing when everything was nearly at stock. So uh, it's not very straightforward, so please be aware. So I will set 5.2 on the P cores, AVX2 ratio to uh, the negative offset to 2. AVX512 will not work if you have the E cores enabled. If you uh, disable the E cores, so make the CPU so just like six cores and 12 threads, you can actually run AVX512. But I will, uh, well, you can put a ne negative offset over here if you happen to uh, disable the E cores. Add on 4.1 with 1.27, we can try that. And uh, let's put uh, FLL override to 1, 1 1.3 volts. The hardest part is still the VDDQ, which I already mentioned a couple of times in my earlier videos. This is, this is actually a very difficult setting. It cannot be too high, but it cannot be too low. On LN2, a good value was between 1.25 and 1.3, but for some reason on air and water, I do need a higher value on this one, so like 1.35. So I'm going to leave it at 1.35, rest are at auto, and memory, you can obviously start at pretty much like XMP level settings. So I will put like 6000, 1.35, 32, 38, 38, 32, and we can put common rate 1 and with some like easy sub timings. 
so these are pretty easy and then we if we uh, go so low on the memory voltage we can disable the extreme voltage mode on this particular board you do need the extreme voltage mode if you want to go higher than 1.435 volts on the memory and I will just put the uh, as I don't have any heatsink on the VRM at the moment I will put the temp measurement at PWM but that's pretty much it so overclocking just the CPU on the older lake platform is actually pretty easy the only difficult thing is honestly this particular voltage nothing else that was the only thing that caused me issues on LN2 so uh, just please be aware but yeah so F10 save and exit okay so let's open up CPU Z and core temp so uh, now I always use Benchmate and Cinebench for initial testing and once I think I may have found like good settings I will uh, use something else to really stress test the CPU it can be Pro95 or Ada64 uh, CPU stress test whatever but you do need to properly test the possible overclock setting if you want to use it for daily use so let's open up R20 R20 does give you a good hint on uh, possible stability but uh, it doesn't guarantee that the overclock is daily stable. First, 5.2 at 1.3 volts, what we already set for one on the E course. But this should be pretty stable. I already uh, I have some rough idea about this uh, CPU or like overall. Temperatures are between uh, 67 and 77 for the P course and E course are around 60. Okay, 7, 8, 16. So now let's open up Elidex 1. But I do already know that 5.3 isn't going to pass. And remember, with uh, this generation, what I already saw with the 12900K is that if your CPU temperatures go above 80 degrees, then you pretty much will not gain anything from increasing the voltage. The only thing to make things more stable is to get lower CPU temperatures. So we can test 5.3. I will also increase the V core as I already want to demonstrate that this isn't going to work. So 1.34 volts over here. Actually, I want to test the uh, input voltage a bit higher. Sometimes you may have to touch the input voltage if things don't seem very stable. This CPU didn't really want to do 5.3 at all. 5.2 was quite happy in uh, various tests like R20 and so on. But this is like, I just want to show you, but this isn't going to pass. Yeah. So 5.2 is pretty much the max for the P cores. Okay, so as we cannot move the P cores at all from 5.2, or well, we could go to per core overclocking. But I generally like to use the all core like function. So now we can try to increase the E cores a little bit. They are currently at 4.1, but uh, as I was testing, the uh, maximum is somewhere between 4.1 and 4.2. 4.2 was almost passing, but it's quite on the edge. So we can try this. Cache isn't very important, so uh, many people don't even try to max out the cache. It does help you a little bit. Uh, in the in performance but not that much really the maximum uh, this CPU seemed to like was 4.4 on the, on the cache and it uses pretty much the same voltage rail as the P core so V core so let's try but this I'm not sure if this is going to pass so uh, usually E cores give that error pop-up screen so uh, I think 4.2 should be stable on the E-Cores if I increase the uh, E-Core add-on voltage from 1.27 to 1.3 to 1.35 but uh, just to uh, prove you the uh, I just want to prove you the uh, cache at 4.4 so let's run again with E-Cores at 4.1 and that's pretty much the maximum in Citibench R20 so now we the only thing we are we want to know is what would be stable for daily use 
So you can see over here in the instruction set list, we don't have AVX 512. And that's why, because we have the E course enabled. So if you uh, disable the E course, you will get AVX 512 running, although the Alder Lake CPUs don't officially support AVX 512. But for some reason, many of the motherboard vendors have got it enabled when you are only running the P cores. And uh, I, I often like to come down a little bit from the maximum uh, CD band settings. So I came down from 5.2 to 5.1. E cores are still at 4.1 and cache is at 4.2. But uh, again, uh, with this generation, I had some weird issues with Pro95. So I had Pro95 failing on some individual uh, workers, even when the CPU was completely at stock. So uh, let's try this again and need to be very careful with the temperatures because this generation actually it actually runs quite hot and this CPU is not deleted. So let's run without any AVX first. Look at the temperatures. This is obviously the point where the AVX negative offsets can be very handy. So now without any AVX, we have the same clock speed, 5.1 to 4.1, cache 4.2, Memory is at 6000, 32, 38, 38, 32, common rate 1, so pretty basic, almost XMP level settings. So far running quite well, but uh, I would always run this at least 30 to 60 minutes to call anything like uh, daily stable. And then of course, if you think it might be stable, you can do some like gaming, video rendering, whatever you do like normally and see if it's still stable. Some people like to run it, run this test for a few hours or even over, overnight, but that's more or less like a personal preference kind of thing. Now, uh, seems to be all right. Let's um, check AVX1, see the temperature difference again, small FFT AVX1, 1.3 volts still. So a bit warmer this time. 82, 83, 85, 86, but this is obviously with a very strong water cooling. If you ran some simple uh, air cooler, uh, it would be uh, throttling al already, I think. So it would be 100 degrees or so. So uh, you have to be very careful with overclocking these older lake CPUs. So now, as last thing, let's stop this and uh, let's try uh, AVX2 or yeah, so full AVX without AVX 512. Okay, so straight to plus 90. So this is definitely warm. 95, this might creep to 100 degrees if we uh, run this for one hour or so. So uh, this is definitely the maximum this could do. So please be cautious when you really start to overclock. Now the uh, negative offset has kicked in. The uh, clock speed has dropped from 5.1 to 4.9 as it, this is utilizing AVX. It doesn't affect the E cores, but uh, so far seems to look just fine. So I think this could be like daily stable, but this is, pro this is pretty much the overall method of overclocking. I'm sure you get the idea. So uh, I would try to come down maybe a little bit on the voltage because this is definitely warm. This is definitely a combination of uh, like lack of deleting and maybe uh, the CPU I just is bending a little bit from the socket retention mechanism. So the contact might not be uh, most ideal, but this is definitely warm. So uh, I think we could call the CPU as 5.1 max for non-AVX, for daily use I mean, and AVX at 4.9. 5.2 might be uh, doable if you like to like a deal it and try to fix the CPU bending issue. But yeah, these temperatures are definitely warm. So that's pretty much it. That's how you overclock uh, this CPU. So it's definitely worse. It's quite a lot worse than the 12900K that I have. So uh, not sure if the K is better on average compared to the KF model, but uh, so far this doesn't really convince me that well, this particular CPU I mean. So 5.1 to 5.2 isn't very good 
for an older lake CPU in something like Cinebench R20 as we do know that the 12900K was doing around 5.5. 5.4 was absolutely solid and 5.1, 5.5 was stable as well as long as the temperatures remained under control like 78 or under. So uh, quite a large difference between the two uh, CPU models. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So uh, I think the weird crashes in Pro95 were something to do with memory overclocking. So don't go too high on the memory. So uh, overclock the CPU first. Leave the memory at XMP level settings and max out the CPU first. Find out the maximum in something like Citibench and also in Pro95. And once you are fully confident that you have found stable settings for CPU, then you can overclock the memory as well and see if it remains stable in Pro95. And remember to stress test the entire capacity of the memory you have installed. So run something like HEI mem test and stress test the full capacity of the memory you have installed. So uh, that's just what I wanted to stress out. Some of these CPUs seem to have quite bad IMC. Some CPUs have very good IMC, but some CPUs do have very bad IMC. So the IMC is too very. One CPU might, might be able to do 6800 MEMS all day long, and the second CPU might struggle only at 6000 or 62000, or 6200 I mean. So uh, just be, please be aware, but that's pretty much it. So uh, thanks for watching this short overclocking video with the 12600KF, and subscribe to my channel, and thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.